but they're struggling. And they don't know how to tell someone that they're struggling. And we believe, it is our core belief, that it all starts with anxiety. And so when we are working with students, our main focus is their anxieties. What are their fears and what is holding them back from being who they need to be? So, would you stick your finger in this? <laughs> no. Why not? Because that's going to hurt. Because it's going to hurt, right? So anxiety, my anxiety, her anxiety says that this is going to hurt. We are perceiving this to be dangerous and a threat. Does that make sense? So imagine, if you will, a student who walks into your classroom, who knows that there is a test today, or knows that there is writing today, or knows that they have to color with inside the lines today. Imagine, if you will, that they think about that the same way one thinks about sticking their finger in a mousetrap. It doesn't really hurt, but the perception is it's going to hurt. It's going to break my finger. My nail might fall, fall off. My finger might fall off. The worst things in the world could possibly happen, but the reality is their anxiety is controlling all of it. How many of you have kids that hate to read? How many have kids that hate to write? How many have kids that hate to be around other kids? <laughs> okay, right? So imagine, if you will, that those fears are coming to them like a mousetrap. Does that change the way that you interact with them? Does that change the way that you view their fear? Or do we still look at it like, no, Johnny, it's okay. It's just writing. Is it just writing? Is it? It was just a mousetrap, but she wasn't going to stick her finger in it. Right? The perception is, is that it's dangerous to me. And so we have to go into these things understanding when we're working with kids that that is their perception. And just because it doesn't mean anything to you does not mean it doesn't mean anything to them. And so that's what we teach them, first and foremost, anxiety, what it is. Anxiety is your body's alarm system. How many know that to be true? Yeah, it's your body's alarm system. If you didn't have anxiety, guess what would happen to you? You would die. Do you know why? Because you'd walk into traffic because you had no fear of it. You would jump off a bridge because you have no fear of it. You have to have anxiety. You have, it's healthy for you. Now, it comes in its unhealthy forms, which we're talking about today, right? In its unhealthy form, we call it the overestimation of fear. Right? I'm overestimating the actual danger. How many of you can relate to overestimating actual danger or fear? Is there anybody in this room that does not have anxiety? If you do not have anxiety, please raise your hand or stand up. Okay, great. That's what I thought, right? We all got it. Right? Even I have it. So I said I was up at 3 o'clock this morning. James and myself and our team, our coaches, we're not doing anything anything super duper special okay I know that sounds weird right because then it sounds like well you're not promoting your business really well Sean right because if you're not doing anything special then why the heck do we have you right well the reality is we are doing some things special but the reality is is that what we're doing is simple we are listening we are validating we are communicating that what they are going through is normal and it's okay. Now the reality is, is that sometimes in your classroom settings, you don't have time to tell them it's okay. You have time to tell them to go wash their hands and get ready for snack because the day needs to keep moving. We have time to tell them that it's okay. Right, so anxieties are common during childhood and adolescence. All children have uncertainty, doubt, and fear. Okay, so say that with me guys. All children have uncertainty, doubt, and fear. Not some, right? Not a percentage, all. So just because you have those students that come into class that are doing extremely well, and it looks like they have, they're on the top of their game, it does not mean they are not struggling or don't have uncertainty, doubt, and fear, because all children have it. That's how we're built. We're built to question. Common anxieties include separation anxiety, performance anxiety, concerns about adequacy, and need for reassurance, and anxieties about harm to a loved one. 
the interesting one about harm to a loved one, and I often come back to this one, is that there are so many children that are so, or that are struggling, worrying about their parents, worrying about their loved one, worrying if they're going to be okay if they come to school. There's a young man that we work with that was throwing some tantrums at the school, struggling to come in in the morning. And when we sat down and talked to him and got him to come in and actually work with us, what we realized was that he didn't want to be at school because he thought his mom was going to jail. He thought his mother was unsafe. Can any of you imagine having to leave your house every day wondering if the person that you loved and cared for you was not going to be there when you got home? Can any of you imagine that? Yes? No? At eight years old? Nine years old? Just to kind of put it into perspective a little bit more. I'm going, to come, I'm going to come to this place, and if I do, when I get home, my mom may not be there for me. And boy, does she love me. That's a difficult thing for a child to try to grasp. And then we wonder why they're freaking out in school. Well, when we find out, we're able to help support that, right? Thoughts create emotions which impact our behaviors, right? The most powerful piece of this is your thought, right? Thoughts are powerful. They literally create your emotional state, which then impacts your behavior and your behavioral outcome. And so we teach this to the students. So what you just heard around anxiety, we teach a lot more in depth, a little bit more, and we're going to talk again more about this. But these are the things that the students that work with us are learning. They're not just coming in, and we're not playing patty cake, guys. And we're not saying, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry your teacher yelled at you. Oh, oh, we're going to fix it and make it better. We don't do that. We sit down with them and we educate them. Because the most powerful thing that these children can have is the education around what's really going on with them. And that's where we sell them. When they realize that this is a normal thing. That it is okay to struggle. And more importantly, that they can then change, which we're going to talk about, their thoughts. And when they change their thoughts, they can change their emotional state. So thoughts, emotions, and behavior, they interplay and influence each other. However, the area where we have most power is our thoughts because they are almost always the foundations of our emotions. That's powerful, right? That's powerful. So what I'd like you to do, if you will, to kind of show you how powerful your thought is. I'd like you to think about something that is so petty that bothers you beyond belief. And you say to yourself, I don't know why I do this, but it's so petty. Can everybody think of that for me? Take, just take a minute. Think about something that's so petty that just irritates you. You can literally, right now, you can feel it. Can you feel your blood boiling? Right? You can feel You feel your heart start to race. You're so angry. You're so frustrated. You can feel that emotion, right? It's so petty. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to realize that it's petty. Right? Let it go. Right? It's petty. It's not a big deal. You're holding on to something that you don't need to hold on to. Right? When you let go of that, did everybody feel the difference in your body? Or are you still thinking about it? Can you not let go? Is that what's going on? Is everybody kind of stuck right now? Do I need to give you guys an extra minute? Right? You need another minute? Okay, so, so everybody's kind of stuck right now. All right, so with me, everybody take a deep breath in, right? All right, now let it out. And just let the pettiness go. And my point is, is that the way that you then change your thought around and realize that it's petty, that it has no real significance, you will then notice the power of your thought and how your thought then changed your emotional state. Your behavioral outcome was, and some of you I can see from a distance, we got frowny faces. Our faces kind of crinkled up, right? Because we're thinking about something that frustrates us, right? That's our behavioral outcome, right? Thought, emotion, behavior. But when we realize that we have the power to change, literally change the way we feel, it's different. I'll give you a for instance. 
if there are a sink full of dishes in the house, right, and I don't want to do them, and I'm mad that the kids left them there, and the missus comes home and tells me to do them, I have a choice that moment. Right? I can get extremely upset because my thought tells me those aren't my dishes to do. I've been at work all day and they're kids and they should do their own stuff. That's my thought. Right? My emotion is, I'm pretty pissed. Right? This is not fair to me. And now I'm getting yelled at by someone who just came home. So that's not fair either. Right? But if I change my thought to they just need to be done regardless, it doesn't really matter, they're in the house, they need to be done anyway, and I'll talk to the kids after the fact about it, then my emotional state changes. I'm no longer angry. I realize that there's something that just needs to be done and I do it. Now that's just a for instance, right? But there's all these situations in our lives where we realize that we can change our emotional state. If you get called into the office by your supervisor, right, what might a thought be? I'm in trouble, right? But the reason that we think that is because maybe you did some dumb stuff a couple weeks ago and you might need to get in trouble, right? But if you're not doing anything wrong, if, the, if, if your boss calls you to your office, you're like, oh, cool, we're going to chat, right? That's your thought. And the emotion is, I feel good about this conversation before we even have it. And then the behavior is that you're going to walk in with a smile on your face, maybe shake a hand and say, hey, how's it going? But if you think you're in trouble, you're gonna walk in with a frowny face with your eyes down, and you're gonna walk in and, yeah, what's up, right? That makes sense? So again, we are teaching the kids every single day, thoughts create emotions which impact behavior, and we are constantly, constantly challenging them, right? When they say, I talked to Mrs. So-and-so, or I talked to Mr. So-and-so, and they were mad at me. We say, what is the evidence? What did they say to you? We challenge it, right? What we want to do when we're, when we're working with students is we want them to recognize what exactly they're thinking, they're feeling, and what their behavior is. And a lot of times what we do is we work backwards. What was your behavior? What were you feeling at that time? And now let's talk about what the thought is. Because that's what we have to work with, right? We're dealing with behavioral issues sometimes. But all of our senses, yours, mine, everybody, Joe Schmoe's, everybody's, they're always going like this to sense danger and pick up very specific cues to let us know what's happening and how we should feel, think, and act within the room. We teach kids it's important to understand that the brain has evolved rapidly to interpret everything that we experience. And that it's so good at it that it just happens a lot of times, right? And so when we are letting kids know that these things are just happening on autopilot, there's a light that goes on in their head because then they say to themselves and to us, wait a second, so you mean I'm not crazy, that this is okay. So you'll hear me say that a lot is that we're, we're, we're telling kids all the time that it's okay, what they're dealing with is normal because it is. One of the things that's really important that we talk about is what happens in your mind has been a learned pattern of thinking that is faulty, right? And so when we talk about that, we have to understand that we are, we are working with, with kids kindergarten through, through 12th grade, right? And then sometimes some of the adults. But what happens is that in the, in the brain, right, we have these very specific learned behaviors or thinking patterns because they were put there by someone else, right? So how many of you guys do all this amazing work in the school only to find that they go home to something completely different. Especially when we talk about teaching kindness, right? Caring, empathy, all those things, and they come back the next day, and they're clawing their peers' eyes out, and they're smacking them, and they're yelling at them, and telling them how they hate them, which is not what you taught them just the day before. But the reality is, is that the more that you keep at it, you will imprint in their brains the things that are right for them to do regardless of how difficult it is for you every day. I know it sucks, right? But the reality is, is that the more that you continue to put these, put these things into their brains, the more that it will stick. We just have to keep trying. So the best place to start the discussion is about how, to work in, um, about how thinking works and impacting your life is to look at our emotions. 
Emotions and feelings are neither right nor wrong, accurate or not. So, imagine, if you will, being a child sitting down in a coaching session and hearing that it is okay that you're emotional. The fact that you cried because little Johnny took your ball does not make you a bad kid. The fact that you punched Johnny in the face because he took your ball and you were emotional does not make you a bad kid. It's okay. It's okay to have emotions. So emotions are, are simply your body's reaction to what you're thinking. Your belief system and other unconscious thoughts are happening on autopilot all the time and cause emotion. That's why sometimes you have no idea what you're feeling. Anybody ever, ever, anybody ever not realize why they're crying? Anybody just cry for no reason? <laughs> come on, come on. I got, come on, let's go. Get those hands up, right? We've all cried for no reason, right? There's something that's going on that we're not recognizing, but it's there, okay? And it's okay. And so again, these are the things that we're talking to the students about. We're letting them know that these moments in their life, lives are okay. But we next talk to them about emotional states, how there's two states, it's just not the emotional state. So, this, so there's two different things. The state is the physiological, the feeling that you're experiencing, and the emotion is the psychological interpretation or the label that we put on it, okay? We experience complex states made up of chemical and hormonal interactions that cause a variety of reactions in the body. Our emotions are more interpretations we make of these experiences or the labels that we give them. But imagine, if you will, a child who was raised to believe that an apple is an orange and an orange is an apple who doesn't truly understand the difference because they've grown up in significant poverty and trauma. If you talk to a student about happy, who's significantly traumatized from either poverty or drug addiction or whatever it may be, sexual abuse, verbal abuse, how do they know what happy is? We have to teach them what happy is. We have to model what happy is. We are literally retraining their brain, day in and day out. And then finally, through our CBT process, we teach students emotional regulation skills. Who here believes, like I do, and you don't have to agree with me just because I believe it, that emotional regulation is the thing that most of our kids are struggling with today? So about 85%, yeah? That is the biggest struggle. They do not know how to manage their emotions. Right? Now, in all fairness, some of you don't know how to manage your emotions. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know how to manage my emotions sometimes. Right? We all get caught. So imagine if you, as adults who have lived a lot of life, get caught unable to manage your own emotional state, how much more difficult do you believe that it is for a child? And we chastise, we chastise them. We want, we want our pound of flesh. Because little Johnny did something wrong and was so emotional that he, he lashed out. And we want to know what the consequence for his actions are. How are we going to make him pay tomorrow in school? We send out emails. We send out phone calls, we talk to our peers, and we say, that's just not fair. They let him get away with it. How is he going to pay for what he did? Well, wait a second. You seem all hot and bothered under a collar right now. You seem like you're not thinking emotionally clear. Like you're dysregulated. Why is that bothering you so much? Is it because possibly you grew up in an era where there was a pound of flesh for everything that you did? So you don't think it's fair, and you don't even realize you don't think it's fair. Right? The reality is that just because I was spanked as a child does not mean that I need to spank my children, does it? Just because your teacher hit you in the hand with a ruler when you didn't listen doesn't mean that you need to do the same thing to them. These are the things that we teach our students. We teach them about us. A lot of times in our sessions, we talk about ourselves. We talk about being able to emotionally regulate how we don't do it well 
and how it's still okay for them not to do it well as long as they learn how to communicate with someone after the fact. Own up to it. And are, le- and are willing to continue to learn and try to work through it. Because the more they understand and know about their emotions, the easier it's going to be for them to stay engaged in your class and more importantly, easier for you to get them back on track. And I'll give you a good way, and I'm gonna get, we're gonna talk some stuff later on, but I just, I wanna give you one thing that I think if, if you can take this with you, I promise you, and I, I've, I've had teachers come up to me and talk to me at other schools about this after, if you can remember this one thing when talking to a student, okay, you will always be on the right side of it. If you start a sentence with, I need you, you've already started the conversation off wrong. And this is with a, tr- a, a, this is with a struggling student, a student that's currently in the midst of crisis and struggling. Does that make sense? So not, not your everyday student, because we all need kids to do stuff. I get that. So when we have a student that's struggling, that's in crisis, that's struggling, and you start off with, I need, you've already started the conversation wrong. Does that make sense? Because your first thought should be in your mind, what do they need? Your second thought should be, how can I support them? And there should never be a thought about what it is that you need. Does everybody know what a trigger is? Yep. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Anybody, anybody not know what a trigger is? So triggers are those things that's, that, are imp- that are imprinted into our brains to let us know something either good or bad. It doesn't always have to be bad. When you walk into a house and you smell chocolate chip cookies, what do you think? Yum. Cookies. cookies, yum, right? Some people start salivating. Some people go directly to the refrigerator. They start looking for a glass of milk. And then they find out that nobody made cookies, they were made earlier, and somebody left with them in the house. And now you're stuck with a glass of milk on the counter, which has happened to me many times, and it's very discouraging, and it hurts my feelings, and then I have to call somebody and tell them to make me more chocolate chip cookies because they took them to school, and it's just not fair, right? Yeah, that's what happens. So, we all have triggers, both good and bad, and we have to understand when working with students, one of the things we need to learn is what are their triggers? So, as adults, You need to learn what they are. In coaching, right, we're helping them to identify what they are. And then we're coming to you and saying, hey, so just so you know, when this is done and this is done, that's going to, they're going to lose it, right? This is not a good thing for them. Here's how we can work around that, right? So now, also understanding that some kids take a little bit longer to open up and to tell us what their triggers are because a lot of times they don't even realize that they're actual triggers, right? And depending on the student that we're, we're actually working with and, what they're speci- and the reason that they're actually with us will kind of depend on what direction we go when we start to talk about triggers. So if we have a lot of high risk behaviors that we're dealing with, we want to talk about triggers probably more sooner than later because we want to be able to, you know, slow those behaviors down and give you guys the tools to be able to support those students quicker. But if we have a student that's just struggling with some anxiety stuff and, and, and uh, it's kind of mild, if you will, or moderate, which we've had a couple of those, those students, triggers kind of come in a lot later. But it's not information that they don't get, if that makes sense. So that you guys know, like these are the things that we are teaching every day, right? And we don't teach it just in like, all right, so we're gonna go from anxiety, we're gonna go to thought, create emotions, we're gonna go to here, we're gonna go to, we don't do it that way, right? We may start a session off with talking about the individual and their family and what they like to do for fun. And then we might slip something in with anxiety. And then we might realize that they said something to us that can trigger a response to us to talk to them about recognizing their emotions. Does that make sense? So our our sessions don't have this platform that's laid out step by step by step by step by step on how we're going to do it and what we're going to do it and and, and what day and time and all this. But all of this information is in there. It's all there. They learn it. 